Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold, and you know, we love Jesus. We we want to share the hope we have in our hearts with others. But sometimes we think to ourselves, how's the best way to start a conversation? Or how do I tell my story? Or how do I invite someone to an event? And how do I listen to someone in stereo where it's the Holy Spirit and the person talking? So... And then what are stages most people go through on their way to a born-again experience, a conversion to their faith in the Lord Jesus? Now, we're going to talk about that today with Rick Madsen. He uh, knows a lot about this. He has been with InterVarsity since 1981. He has been uh, sharing his hope with um, students and with faculty, and he's been an evangelist, an apologist, and a trainer for Graduate Facility Ministries, uh, which is also a, a division of InterVarsity, I believe. I'll get this clarified in just a minute. But I'm always glad to have Rick on the program. And Rick, I'm looking forward to this topic today. It's a good one. Yeah, good to see you, Bill. Love talking about uh, sharing our faith with other people. Yeah, and you've also handed me a book called Witness in the Academy. And so if you need a change of mindset or encouragement to get involved in witnessing, this book will help. You'll learn a a fresh framework for evangelism, and it's filled with really inspiring stories, which are always very helpful. And you'll also find practical suggestions for discovering God's work, or God's prior work in others, using Scripture effectively and identifying your role in the mission of Jesus uh, in the world. So, Rick, let's get started with the idea of how do we best start a conversation? I know it can be, we can overthink this, can't we? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think uh, be yourself is maybe uh, a thing to keep in mind that we don't have to have any special evangelism hat that we put on. Evangelism should flow naturally from our relationship with God. And I think there's a theological component to this as well. We've talked about this before as I've uh, visited you folks here, and that is that God goes before us. He's the one who's out ahead of us preparing these conversations. He's the one who's working in the lives of our friends who are not Christians. And our job isn't so much to just proclaim the gospel when we get there, although sometimes we get that opportunity. But often our job is to discern what God is already doing in the lives of our friends who don't know him. And then he invites us to participate in his work of witness. So he's the chief evangelist. So, so we other, come along uh, afterward and participate. Yeah, yes. Rick. So in other words, we start by listening to find out exactly w- we do a diagnostic to see what God's doing in their life. Yes. On campus, we call it spiritual research. So a lot of the graduate students that I work with in the faculty, they're already familiar with this idea of research. That's what they do in the academy, that and teach. And so spiritual research then is uh, this process of discernment, of listening and watching, and kind of observing the whole life of the person I'm with to discern what God is already doing in their life and then uh, jumping in. One of the analogies, pictures that I use for this is that Jesus, we're in the boat. We're out on the water and Jesus is walking on the water and he's beckoning us to climb out of the boat and trust him to walk on the water with the ministry that he's already doing in the lives of other people. And so sometimes it takes an act of faith to climb out of the boat and respond to Jesus' call to come and join him in his work. Well, Rick, I don't know if I've ever heard that put that way before. I have to think about that. He calls yeah. us to climb out of the boat, climb out and of walk the boat. on the water. Yeah, walk on water, where, baby. Where do you get that idea? <laughs> I don't know. It's in the gospel somewhere. Some guy named Peter was I get good that, at it at but first. He <laughs> wanted to get out of the boat. Yeah, yeah, but he took his eyes off the Lord. He took his eyes off the Lord. Yeah, yeah. Well, as we climb out of the boat and take these little risks in witness, I think God really rewards that, and He walks with us 
uh, out on the water where it's wonderful and spiritually adventurous. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I had a conversation today at the gym. Uh, I was sitting in the sauna, and this guy was and I were chatting, and he he said something to the effect of, yeah, I, I grew up, my parents were missionaries. And I thought, boy, didn't he just open the door? Talk about a dropping a little hint. Yes. Um, and what a beautiful thing. I said, yes. oh, you're a believer. He goes, yes, I am. I go, oh, that's awesome. I am too. So we had that instant connection. And yes. it was such a simple little thing he said to me. Yes. Or someone might say, my parents were missionaries, and but I rejected it when I was 20 years old. That's true. That would be another open invitation to conversation. That, that's true. And then instead of preaching at them, then you want to draw them out, hear their story, hear what the reasons were that they uh, went the other way and uh, look for how God might be beckoning them back into the faith and how can we uh, join in on that endeavor. Yeah. My follow-up question was, were they Christian missionaries? Oh, <laughs> good. That was what I said. Yes, it was, oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, there's other missionaries out there as well. And to specify that, I think just those quick follow-up questions and comments that push the conversation forward I think that's the momentum of the Holy Spirit. So it sounds like you followed that today. And all it takes is a simple comment. You, you don't have yeah. to overcomplicate it once again. No. You can say, oh, it was so interesting. Uh, last week at church, I heard, or last week in the parking lot at church, yeah. Yeah. I helped a guy change a tire. And all yeah. of a sudden, wait a minute, you're a, <laughs> a guy helping a guy at a church parking lot. Right, a church parking yeah, lot. Yeah, so, you know, there you go, a conversation starter. Yeah, and you're just being your normal self. You didn't put on an evangelism hat. You didn't push the evangelism yeah. button. You didn't suddenly become this big evangelist. You're just being yourself, and that's the B of evangelism. I know we do evangelism, and I'm not denying that, but there's a kind of B about it. Like, I am an evangelist. I am a Christian who can talk about my faith in normal ways, Without getting all weirded out. Yeah, and I'm not going to start applying some technique I learned. No. I'm just going to be myself. Yeah, you're going to be yourself. Yeah. yeah. you be your inquisitive, caring self. And our curiosity, our listening, our willingness to engage another person and maybe get a little bit below the surface of their life uh, is a way to find out what the Holy Spirit is doing there. Mm-hmm. I've told this story on the show before, but it left such an impression on me, Dr. Jerry Root, who is from Wheaton, uh, the director of evangelism for the Billy Graham uh, School of Evangelism. So he's a significant player Mm -hmm. on the evangelism field. And he said, I am a nervous guy when it comes to sharing my faith. Mm. I went, what? (laughs) How can you say that? You're the guy, you know? Yeah. And he said, I was in the the luggage carousel of the airport in Chicago. And we're waiting for the luggage. And I struck up a conversation with the guy next to me. And I said, are you home? Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, well, yes and no. I mean, I'm not originally from here. Uh, I moved to Chicago at, when I was 13 from Ohio when my parents divorced. Mm. Well, look at the information yes, exactly. he just gave him. I know. It's unbelievable. Yeah. If we are inquisitive, I don't mean in a way that uh, we're out interrogating people. Some people just don't want to talk. That's fine. But a gentle question on the front end sometimes can open up a whole vista. Oh, yeah. A whole world of conversation and some people are just dying to tell their life story, especially if the Holy Spirit is kind of prompting them, is, is preparing them, and they will tell their life story. I was at a golf course one day, and this guy, I think his wait, name wait, was wait. Uh, Joe. You at a golf course? Me, this sounds uh, made up all of a sudden. hard to believe. Yes. My two worlds being campus and golf courses. Yeah, okay. But I said to this guy, I'd never met him before, and we just bumped into each other in the first tee, and I said, well, hi, I'm Rick. I'm from Minnesota. We were, we were in Arizona at the time, and I said, hey, how's your game? which is a typical golf question. And then he proceeded to tell me, well, not too good lately because I have a, an injured back. Okay. Well then what happened? You know, how how is your back and how's it doing? How'd that happen? And then boom, he told me his life story in like 10 minutes. (laughs) And all I did really was ask, how's your game? And then everything opened up from there. And then when he was done telling his life story, I took that as an indication from God that I should say something spiritual. So I said, hey, Joe, I'm a praying man. I'm praying for your back right now. And I looked at him and I said, oh, God, would you bring healing to Joe's back in Christ's name? Amen. (laughs) And that was it. It was like a six-second prayer. It wasn't 
sanctimonious. I didn't lay hands. I didn't call the church. I didn't put. I didn't uh, anoint his head. None of nothing like that. Just a simple prayer, looking him in the eye as I spoke, and then I've never seen him again. So maybe the Lord healed him. Maybe the Lord brought him to faith. I do not know. Yeah. Well, the gentleman I spoke to, his name is David. In the in the sauna today, mm-hmm. uh, I said he he said that he was just uh, kind of between jobs and he had a job interview, which he said, I'm really, I'm really hoping, um, goes well. And I said, can I pray for you? Yes, him? exactly. Can I just pray for that yes. job? interview? So I yes. prayed for him right yes. there. Right there. And it was it's just a lovely moment. I said, I have yeah. to pray soon because I have to get out of the sauna. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So let's yeah, speed this up. It's kind of hot in here. It is very hot in there. Yes. yes. Yeah. 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 But yeah, it's cool outside. Yeah. But I think that practice really helps. The first time we have a spiritual conversation, it can be a little awkward. And the second time, maybe slightly less awkward. And then the 5th and the 8th and the 12th and the 50th. And for me, the 500th, you just keep doing it. And then stuff starts to feel way more natural than it did maybe those first few times. And then you're out on the water and you're walking in the waves and it's splashing all around. And you have the hand of Jesus out there, if I can keep using that metaphor and at first, the first time, you might sink like Peter, and then the second time, you do a little better. And the third time, you walk 100 yards. And then mm-hmm. fourth time, further and more deeply into this whole world of witness, which God is already doing. It's not like he's waiting for me. He's already doing it, and then he's beckoning us into the process. Yeah. You're not starting from scratch. No. <laughs> no. This this is already in motion. Yeah. I used to think I was bringing Jesus to people because they don't have him and I do. So the Jesus that I have in my life, yeah. I'm depositing into theirs. And I just think scripture uh, teaches something different. I brought a couple of Bible verses here. Are we okay quoting the yeah, Bible here in this Yeah, I practically okay. insist you do. Yeah, I am an adjunct professor at Northwestern here. We use the Bible a lot, Bill. Yeah. Do you want me to, <laughs> do you want me to read more of your credits? Uh, no, that's okay. Okay, because I can. <laughs> I have them in front of me. It's okay. All right. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 6, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. He is the one who is the active agent. We do our work, and then we allow the Holy Spirit to do his work. But he already got there ahead of us to open up the conversation in the first place. Mm-hmm. Or here's another one, John six forty four. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. So the the Father is the one who draws people to his Son, and you get involved with someone who's being drawn. Mm-hmm. And then we get to enter that world, enter that ministry place that God is already working. Rick Matson is my guest, who is an adjunct professor here oh, at the yeah. University of Northwestern. I'll drop that little I one. Love preach- I love uh, preaching, yeah, teaching here at Northwestern. Well, I figured you, you, you do. And he's also... Uh, with InterVarsity and have been with them since 1981. So, Rick, let's talk about some of the uh, things we hear that might feel like the responsibility, everything is up to us, where people say, are you sharing your faith? Have you led anyone to Christ? And I think, well, I don't, I'm not going to lead anyone to Christ. The Holy Spirit's going <laughs> to yeah. do that work. Yeah. But you start to feel like, well, is, that a, is that on my shoulders? Yeah. But what's on my shoulders is to share the good news in my heart. Yeah. With someone. Well, uh, Doug Schaup and Don Everts wrote a book called I Once Was Lost. And in there, after several hundred interviews with people who came to faith, they discerned that there were five, generally five stages that people go through in coming to faith. So they're called the five thresholds of conversion. And the first one is just to trust a Christian. You get into a relationship. You bond with someone. Trust is developed. And then... You notice that perhaps God is opening up their life and they become curious about the bigger questions in life or they become curious about what other people believe or they become curious about how their life might be improved. So there's kind of this curiosity factor Mm -hmm. in their life. And then thirdly, uh, they become open to change in their life. So first is trust. Second is curious. Thirdly, they become open to change change. And usually this third threshold, they're called this third threshold, is the one that's probably most difficult to cross, to go from curiosity to actually being open. uh, That really takes a work of God. So for example, I'm curious about Islam. I hang out with Muslims, especially when I go to Rice University in Houston, Texas every year. 
uh, hang out with the good Muslim folk down there. I really enjoy that. I'm super curious about Islam and everything. Not really open to becoming a Muslim, though. So to go from curiosity to openness is probably the most difficult threshold to cross. And then once a person really is open, then the next threshold is that they become a seeker, a true seeker of God. And then fifthly, they cross the line of faith. So they go from trust to curious to open to seeking to crossing the line. So when I enter someone's life, I don't know where they're going to be at. Maybe they're already in threshold three. Maybe they're already open. Mm -hmm. And then my conversation with them is going to be more explicit and more pointed about the gospel. Mm -hmm. Early on, it might be a little bit more generalized. Are you a religious person? Are you interested in spiritual things? Are you a person of prayer? Do you have any religious background? Those sorts of more general questions will lead us deeper. But the deeper they get into crossing the five thresholds, the more I can be uh, specific about what the the gospel is and invite them, uh, make a call to faith in their lives. Mm-hmm. Rick Matson is my guest. We're going to take a little break and come back and continue our discussion on neighbor evangelism or neighborhood witness or campus witness. We want to be making sure that we're doing our best to start a conversation or make sure we tell our story or how to invite someone to an event or how to listen in stereo, part Holy Spirit, part to the other person. And uh, we'll be right back. If you have a question or comment, you can send it over to 877-933-2484. Welcome is a word said universally all over the world. Every language on the planet has their own way of making a friendly greeting. At Faith Radio, when we welcome, we really mean it. Learn more about us by requesting a free welcome pack gift. Text the word WELCOME to 877-933-2484 or visit MyFaithRadio.com to request your welcome pack today. And a warm welcome to you. I am not tired of encouraging you to think about witnessing and sharing your faith and how to start a good conversation or how to tell your story and how to invite someone to an event. And Rick Matson is my guest And we're talking about the stages that people go through on their way to conversion. And uh, that really piqued my interest, Rick, when it started with trusting a Christian. Now, if you start a conversation with somebody, do you ever say, do you have any friends that are Christian? (laughs) Because they may love some of their friends who are Christian. So in a way, they've already trusted someone who's a Christian. Yeah, that's a good point. And it reminds me that this is a team sport. Yes. The whole thing isn't on my shoulders I just want to do my little part that God has given me to play. And I don't want to fall behind in this conversation if the Holy Spirit has opened up a longer and deeper conversation because I'm so cautious and so fearful. I don't want to fall behind right. what the Holy Spirit is doing. But I don't want to get ahead of the Holy Spirit either. I don't want to be, become so aggressive and so determined to share what's on my mind that I uh, get ahead of what God has prepared this person for. So I think... You know, you know, we talked about this phrase, listening in stereo. That means I have to be listening to the Lord as I'm also listening to this other person mm-hmm. made in the image of God who is right here in front of me on an airplane or in an airport or on a golf course or a campus or in a neighborhood or workplace, whatever it might be. I'm listening in stereo. So I like to, to metaphorically, of course, tilt my head like this so my left ear is up toward God. Listen, God, what do you want me to say right now in this mm-hmm. conversation? But I'm also listening to this person really carefully and just gently asking that next question that takes things a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper, and just see what's there. See what God has done to prepare this person for maybe some kind of disclosure to me, maybe a friend or maybe I'm a stranger, but disclosure to me that could show what God is doing. And as I'm listening in stereo, then I want to be asking myself this question, okay, how far have you taken this person? Should I keep going? Or now that I've asked this person two or three, four questions, I don't want to become the interrogator. Maybe it's time for me to share something about my life. Mm, If I want them to disclose something a little bit more personal, then I should be the one maybe who leads out with that and disclosing something a little bit more personal about my life. And that will often evoke... Uh, their disclosure as well. They're more willing to share if I've kind of set the table for that or set the example for that uh, before them. 
Mm -hmm. So if the Holy Spirit's prompting you to tell part of your story, how much of it do you share and how long do you talk? (laughs) Oh, hours. Oh, boy, that's not the answer we're looking for. Uh, You know, I do this all the time, so I have various ways to do that. But I would suggest for people maybe who are a little bit newer at this or fearful uh, to develop maybe three versions of their uh, their faith story, their their testimony. So you should have a one or two minute version where you can just quickly summarize either how you came to faith or how you grew up in the faith. And maybe you put in a struggle or two that you've had and that you've maybe been able to overcome or haven't overcome it. Yeah, that's okay. Mm-hmm. Just be real about it. And then secondly, you've got a version of the story that's maybe maybe 10 minutes and you can talk about it a little longer. And it's got some other elements in there that add to the drama of how you came to faith. And then, of course, you can have a 15 to 30-minute version that goes into a lot of the detail. I think sensitivity is something Christians could probably (laughs) use a little growth in. So you have to be sensitive about whether the other person really wants to listen to that 24-minute monologue or not. Right. If they're ready for that, go for it. Mm-hmm. Even then, I want to pause along the way and say, are you doing okay? <laughs> you need a glass of water? I'm kind of talking a lot here. Uh, but sometimes they're not ready for 24 minutes. They're ready for six or seven minutes, or they're ready for that one or two-minute summary, which can just plant a seed mm-hmm. and help us launch into the topic more deeply next time around. And I always find it important for me when I share a, fa- a faith story whether it's two minutes or 24 minutes, Rick, that I talk about the truth of Scripture, and that's why I came to faith, yes. because the Scriptures reveal truth. Yes. And it wasn't some emotional feeling I had at youth camp when I was 14 yeah. or anything. It was, I came to faith because I believe God's Word. Yes. I wish I could say that. I came to faith on an emotional basis, but r- shortly thereafter, I thought, what have I done? Can this right. whole worldview just be based on my perceptions? No. And then studying Scripture and studying the discipline of apologetics is what really grounded my faith. And that's a story in itself. You know, there doesn't have to be this formula. Maybe zooming out, there's a little bit of a formula that says, what was my life life like before I came to Christ? How did I come to Christ? And now what is it like after I've come to Christ? Or if I grew up in the church, what was my childhood faith like and then how did i develop a more adult faith so zooming out maybe you could call that i wouldn't really call that a formula it's kind of a template for sharing your faith but inside that template it can go a variety of places tell the stuff that is so meaningful to you tell how you were transformed tell about those moments where it was just an aha light bulb went on and and how that happened that can really be inspiring for another person Mm -hmm. that you're sharing with yeah Uh, rick manson is my guest Rick, when I have a conversation with someone and they come at me, they're they're, they're angry or they're I'm not interested at all. I I always have to say, well, okay, Bill, what's Plan B? Yeah, Plan B. Yeah. <laughs> and Plan B is, would you mind sharing with me the God that you rejected or yeah. the God that made you so angry? Yeah, you know that's good. And then they usually go on to say that you know something bad happened when I was 12 or. You know, my dad died when I was 15, and why would God do that? So yeah. I couldn't trust him anymore. Yeah. And that made me mad, and, and I, I'm not, I'm not, I can't follow that God. Yeah. Yeah, my friend Tom, that's what happened to him. He grew up in the church, and then he had a, uh, a condition, a malady, a neural condition, and he prayed that God would take it away, and God didn't. And then he lost a bunch of his friends, and... So he felt lonely, and he found more solace in the atheist community than in the Christian community, which That's is sad. really a sad tale. But anyway, drawing that out of him, now I know what his background is, how he came to his atheist position, and now he's entrenched in atheism. And uh, So I've got the arguments of apologetics to work with, with uh, him, with, with Tom as his name. But I've also got his uh, background and his story, which I can ask about on occasion, and he shares about it freely, so it's it's pretty cool. We have a good relationship, but I think the plan B, I really like that. Ask what happened. Ask their story. Just gently, would it be okay if I just, would you mind sharing a bit about that? I like I like how you put that in a very gentle way. We're not forcing people to do anything here they don't want to do. Yeah. But we're offering an open door for them to share something of themselves. Maybe share it 
in a way that no one else has asked them to do. And it can be therapeutic. It can be, it can feel good to them to open up about that. And then who knows what the Lord might do from there. Yeah. Just to gently invite, tell me about the God that you rejected or, or the reason you were, you've walked away from any kind of interest in faith. Yes. And then if the Lord provides an opportunity, then I can say, hey, would it be okay if I shared a couple of reasons that I've stayed in the faith, even though yeah. I too have had some hard times and I might share a hard time or two. And I said, but I decided to stay. And could I share with you a reason or two? So you're, you're asking consent. And I think that's a, a positive thing. You're really respecting where the other person is coming from. With mm-hmm. that. Rick Manson is my guest. And Rick, when you uh, start a conversation with somebody Is it always on your mind that if I can get to a spiritual point, that's my ultimate goal? Or or do you not think that way? I do think that way. Oh, good. (laughs) I do think that way. And then the trick is to do it in a loving way and not a manipulative way. And I think that just takes practice. So I want to be a person who authentically shares Christ as an integrated part of my life, not as some separate separate room that we walk into, the the evangelism room. I want it to flow naturally from who I am. So that means my time in Scripture, my time in prayer, my time at church and in fellowship is where the integrated, where Christ is integrated into my regular life, not just the spiritual dimension, but into my regular life. Then when I'm talking about my regular life, whether it be in hobbies, sports, theater, uh, for me, it's golf or campus or your work or travel or whatever it might be. And Christ is a part of every single one of those topics. Yeah. And so no matter what topic we're talking about, if Christ is integrated into that place, then I can naturally bring up a spiritual idea uh, from that particular topic. Yeah. But John, I think it just takes a lot of practice. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Uh, John just made a great comment, and I want to bring this up with you, Rick, yeah. because he's done this w- work for a decade and and it's like he said most people have not responded to hearing my story it's like oh good so what but he said getting them to see and realize their own imperfection and sins and see their need for jesus yeah. and i i always think well if i'm living an immoral lifestyle and you can look at my life and go well he's living an immoral lifestyle yeah and i think to myself well i'm not living an immoral lifestyle you're one of those Bible thumpers that calls everything a sin. <laughs> right. And I, you know, so how do you get to that point where you say you don't think you're leading an immoral lifestyle, but you are? <laughs> yeah. I think the deeper we get into the conversation, the more of the whole biblical story I can share. Okay. And that biblical story involves not only a good creation, but a fallen creation. Not only human beings created good, but human beings fallen and now measured by, among other things, let's just say the Ten Commandments can walk through the commandments. Now, this is pretty deep into a conversation. Yeah, you know, I, I might not so. start this off with a right. person I just meet on an airplane, but I might say, well, have you ever uh, lusted? Have you ever coveted your neighbor's wife? Have you ever lied? Have you ever taken the Lord's name in vain? I mean, you can walk through the Ten Commandments, or you can go to the Sermon on the Mount. Have you ever violated any of these teachings of Jesus? Well, then you're just like me. <laughs> I, too, have violated the scriptural teaching, the scriptural standards, And I'm a sinner just like you, but I'm a forgiven sinner. Would you too like to be a forgiven sinner? But the first hard step in this is admitting we even have sin in our lives. That's true. So this is pretty deep into the conversation. Yeah. And maybe I'm reading the Bible with this person over a period of weeks. Uh, One of my friends, we're reading through the Gospel of Mark together. So right now we're in Mark 6. And we just read about it and talk about it. There's no big agenda, but the scripture itself is so powerful. Yeah. And pretty soon you start to see that your own life doesn't measure up to the perfection of the life of Jesus. Well, how can we get there? Not in our own strength. It's by being forgiven, filled with the Spirit, and then we can move forward. All right. We'll take a little break and come right back with Rick Matson. We're talking about uh, neighbor evangelism, neighborhood witness, campus witness. We just want to be uh, alert to every person that is around us and how we can start a conversation or tell our story. And if there's an event that you can invite someone to, the power of the 
invite is such a big deal. So many lives have been changed because people were invited to something. So good. If you have a question or comment, 877-933-2484. Be right back. It's the Afternoon Show with Bill Arno. Drive time, drive time. Let's get it started. Jump in your car. What's for dinner? It's the Afternoon Show with Bill Arno. Oh, I never get tired of talking about encouraging you to be a witness uh, for Christ and look for ways to start conversations or tell your story. When was the last time you told your story? When was the last time you had an opportunity with someone that maybe it wasn't in your inner circle or your not part of your friends or you just someone you met and you were able to tell your story and you're able to share your hope with someone when did that happen last i'm curious and rick matson here and rick let's talk about uh, how to invite someone to an event well there's a number of ways but uh, the way that we use a lot in uh, the InterVarsity grad ministries where I work is we have this three-step method for inviting. And the first thing you do is just tell about the event itself. And then the second thing you do is tell why I'm going, why it's meaningful to me. So there's an autobiographical part of this. And then the step three is you make the invitation. I'd love to have you join us. So can we do a little role play here? Uh, Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Bill, how's it going? Uh, Good. Really good. Thank you for asking. (laughs) I haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, I know. I know you have a purpose. radio show. Yeah. <laughs> Keeps you busy. Yeah, And other busy. things. Yeah. I've heard you do other things, too. I do. I'm a very busy guy. Yeah, you're very busy guy. Yeah. Hey, next Tuesday night, my church is uh, having a picnic at uh, Central Park here in Roseville. And it's a thing that we do two or three times every summer. And the reason that I'm going is that I just find it so much fun to sit with folks and just talk about regular life and to eat some really good food and uh, get our shelter from the sun in these picnic shelters there. And it's a a really good time. Uh, The fellowship is warm. The food is good. Anyway, my wife and I are going, and we would love to have you join us next uh, Tuesday night at 5 o'clock, Central Park. Any chance that you could come with us and sit with Sharon and I. And, hey, we will provide the food. And Sharon's a good cook, mm. so we'd love to have you join us. All right. Well, you have my attention. Yeah. I'll have to check my calendar. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, I'll get back to you. Okay. Well, would it be okay if I checked in with you like uh, Sunday or Monday? Cause yeah, the event definitely. Is on Tuesday. Shoot, shoot me a text, yeah. and okay. I'll, uh, I'll I'll be able to respond by then. Okay. That sounds really good. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I'll I'll talk to you then. I'm not. I mean, I'm. I'll just be honest. I'm. Yeah. I'm not much for like church picnics and stuff. So. Oh, that's totally. I mean, okay. I don't want to have to. You know talk to a lot of people <laughs> you know picnic shelter we will also shelter you bill from any awkward all right, conversations all right, all right. you're not <laughs> going to try to convert me are you well i don't know it it depends if you want to be converted or not if not then no okay <laughs> <laughs> all right so how did that role play go yeah yes, me. I, I think it was very good oh good what what is your response, Rick, when somebody does just that, which is what Bill said, and they almost say, "Well, I'll let you know. I'll give you a text." Is it to say, <laughs> "Can I check in with you?" Like yeah, you did, because no. yeah. otherwise you may not hear. No, from them you'll again. never hear from them. No, right. I say, "Well, is it okay if I check in with you like Sunday or Monday?" Right. Uh, can I shoot you a text? Yeah. Now I've I've done my part. I did a verbal ask and a text. That's enough. In ninety percent of the situations, I don't have to do anything more. It's in God's hands. He's the one who prompted me to do this in the first place. If He's working in the person's life, then they're going to respond, hopefully with a yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if I pester and pester and pester, I'm probably getting outside of the gentle leading of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, getting ahead of His what He's doing there. I just want to debrief the role play and say, here's what I didn't do. Okay, and what. Minnesotans tend to do a lot like, hey, Bill, what are you doing next Tuesday night at 5 o'clock? Well, that's a bad yeah. question. Okay, that's a bad question. Yeah, why, why are you asking? Because, yeah, why are you asking? Because yeah. now you're kind of trapping. I'm not going to say no. I'm free. No, exactly. Uh, yeah. You don't want to get trapped into something. Like, right. well, I'm free. Why do you ask? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so no, don't sudden, not say free. that. Or uh, another way to say this is uh, uh, Sharon and I are going to an event next uh, Tuesday night. We really want you to come. Um, don't not, say that either. No. 
No. It's way more honest, way more clear, and way more convincing to just tell what the event is in, in and of itself. And then secondly, you've got to tell the autobiographical part of this. Why am I going? Why is it meaningful to me? Mm-hmm. It's not just the event. It's my experience of the event. And maybe I went to one, two others this summer, which I did. And I had such a good time, I want to go back. That's why I'm going. So there's a testimonial part to this that is more compelling for many people than the event itself. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, I was really moved by this. Yeah. Okay, then thirdly, it's, oh, Bill, if you want to go, just uh, email me, okay, if you want to go. Or, Bill, if you want to go, just text me. No, I didn't do that either. No, you didn't. I said, we would love to have you join us. That communicates value. Like, our experience of this event would be enhanced by having you with us. That's way more of an active invitation than the very, very passive invitation. Well, hey, if you feel like going, got nothing else to do, text me, and uh, I'll see you there. I've got an out yeah, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Way too easy of an out. Now yeah. I'm falling behind the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I would say something like it's yeah. a church picnic, so it's 90% mayonnaise. So if <laughs> exactly. you have... You know, if you can't handle mayonnaise, you've got a legitimate out not to come. <laughs> that's right. And then they laugh and they go, oh, yeah. that's all right. It's a yeah. church picnic. Yeah. There's a lot of jello at this picnic. Oh, for sure. And yeah, and it's always we might moving. even have jello on a stick. Yeah, right, so, right. So, yeah, so humor helps and works as well. But uh, you've got to tell why you're going. And that's the gold in the, in the invitation, yeah. the three-step invitation. So I just had a text that says, what if it's a family member? Do we ask differently? Sure. Yeah. Uh, Ask contextually. But the template stays the same. What the event is, why I'm going, and uh, love to have you along. Mm -hmm. You know, I know you work and I I know you're busy, but uh, Sharon and I'd love to have you with us next Tuesday night. How much lead time are you giving me? Uh, in this case, I'm giving you four days, I guess. It's Friday. Okay. But, yeah, it just depends. Like, if I'm inviting you to a play here at Northwestern, it might be... Are you an adjunct professor here? I am an adjunct professor here. And I get free tickets. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, so I might look out on the calendar six weeks. Sure. Say, hey, this date is coming up. Uh, here's the event. The reason I'm going is because the last play I went to was really good. And I went to Peter Pan or whatever it might be, and I was just moved. And they do such a professional job here. Love to have you go with us. You might not know your calendar right now. Could I check in with you in a week or two and just see if you might be free to go? And then they can think about it a little bit. They can go online and look to see if this is the kind of play they want to go to. And then we can have the next conversation from there. Mm -hmm. But I'm communicating that I value their presence. Yeah. All right. Um, I love this comment. Even if uh, even if you ask someone to attend and they turn you down, you've planted a seed. Exactly. And someone in the future, um, you might be able to take them to the next event. Exactly. So on campus, then I might say, hey, there's a lunch. There's a lecture at lunch next Monday. Uh, Here's why I'm going. Love to have you with us. And they say, oh, I can't. And I go, oh, no, that's okay. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, This is a it's a monthly series every Monday at lunch. There's this lecture series on medical ethics or whatever it might be. And uh, we'll just invite you again. My friend and I are going. So I also want to say to the person, whether or not you come with me is not going to determine if I'm going. I am going. Yeah, I like that. And my other friend is joining me. If you come, it's going to be a threesome. We're going to have a good time. Maybe I can pick you up. We can walk over together from our department. So that's more campus talk right there. But it can apply to neighborhoods as well. Mm -hmm. I love this comment. Hey, Bill, I understand you've got a radio show. Whatever. Do you like (laughs) Jell-O? Well, if you're in Minnesota, you got to say yes. I know you have to say yes, Yes. but I'm not a real fan of Jell-O. No. Okay. Yeah. Well, in Minnesota, at least you can pretend to like Jell-O. Yes. (laughs) All right, Rick Manson is my guest. If you uh, have a question or comment and you are a person that is always looking for ways to share your faith and you've got something that's really working well for you Mm. um, and it enables you just to be you, we'd love to hear what that is, 877-933-2484. I know when, when someone from a listener encourages another listener, it's a really big deal. Hey, that's pure ministry right there. That is pure ministry. 877-933-2484. I'll be right back with Rick. We carry each other's burdens. Please know you can bring us your prayer concerns and we will pray. 
Share your prayer request with the Faith Radio team by texting or calling 877-933-2484 or share your prayer requests with the Faith Radio staff and listeners at myfaithradio.com. Rick Manson is my guest. We're talking about one of my favorite topics, which is just getting out and sharing your faith with people. And if you're looking for uh, some insights, Rick's the guy to uh, to give us some encouragement, inspiration, how to start a conversation, how to tell your story, how to invite someone to an event, how to be listening to the Holy Spirit and to the person you're talking to at the same time. Mm. And uh, a very helpful uh, stages you gave us earlier in the hour, Rick, about what people go through on their way to faith in Christ. And that was very helpful. If you missed if you missed that, you definitely want to go hear that on the podcast at myfaithradio.com. All right. I appreciate um, your wisdom on this, Rick, and I've learned something about uh, to be careful and to be, um, when it comes to an invitation, is to be intentional and put things in places that, that make it, I'm not going to say you're putting more pressure on somebody, but you're 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 asking them to be accountable to your your ask. Yes. You're just saying, would you respond to me? Yes. And you're really being more honest. In fact, I do value you coming with me to the picnic or to if we're going to the Salvation Army or wherever it is, a play at the the college here. I in fact I do value that and to sort of communicate that, hey, it's no big deal either way. It's not even true about me. So if I invite you to a play here at the college, I really do want you to join my wife and me. And so when I communicate that in the invitation, I'm being even more honest than if I just leave things open-ended. Mm-hmm. You know, in this casual culture, we let people off the hook too easily. Yeah. And we're so afraid of offending that I think sometimes we fall behind what the Holy Spirit is leading us to do. And being honest is what the Holy Spirit, I think, is leading me to do. Yeah. And being honest is communicating that I value your presence with us at the Grace Church Roseville picnic next Tuesday night. Mm-hmm. I really do. Nice. Nice. All right, Rick, I would love to spend some time talking about how we can uh, start a conversation. And and I want to invite people who are listening right now to be part of this conversation. <laughs> okay. So I started talking about a conversation... Let's just have it okay. with everyone who might be uh, kicking the tires when it comes to their, their Christian faith, or maybe they're not, they're outside the family of God mm-hmm. and they don't even know it, mm-hmm. but they've heard talk about sin. They've heard talk about repentance. They've talked about uh, you know, all the things that, that they've been you know, told that they're doing wrong mm-hmm. and it does not working for them. Mm-hmm. But we, we want to lead them to a place where they go, I have a need for need right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I want people to have an invitation tonight. Yes. Before this show ends, that they can plant their flag and pray to receive Christ tonight. Okay. Are we doing this together? Are you doing it? Am no, I we'll doing do it? it together? Okay, let's we'll take it. Together. Wyatt's in too if he wants. Wyatt? You want in, Wyatt? I'm in. You want a piece of this? <laughs> I, I oh, want the Trinity. Here. I want the whole thing. <laughs> you want, okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Wyatt Morrell. <laughs> Way to go, Wyatt. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it starts with the really good news that God has made the world good and beautiful and a place that reflects his glory. That's the first thing that needs to be said. You don't have to start with the trash of this world. You start with the world as envisioned by God as a place of family, as a place of beauty, as a place of glory, as a place where we walk in close harmony with our creator. That's the vision of the book of Genesis right off the bat. And then... Unfortunately, this invitation that God has given us to be in relationship with him, to be part of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this invitation, our forebears, our first human being said, no, we're not going to say yes to your invitation. We're going our own way. So if you start with the good news of Scripture, this is actually the bad news. We filed for divorce pretty quickly in the biblical story, already in the third chapter of Genesis human beings who are our representatives, you might say, first human beings, uh, said no to God's invitation. And then the world fell into turmoil. And our personal lives fell into turmoil. It's what the Bible calls sin. And sin 
you know, an easy definition of sin is sin is separation from God. It's going our own way. It's doing the wrong thing. So now we're in a state of separation from God. And that's kind of the bad news of Scripture. So I got us started here. So if Wyatt or Bill wants to kind of take the next step in the story, uh, go for it. Well, I'm j- I'm going to say, Rick, I'm hearing you, and this sounds interesting, but I'm a good person. And I, I know that um, my God would not say that I'm not a good person. <laughs> so there. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess it depends what we mean by good. If we mean perfection, that would be uh, exemplified. That would be shown in the life of Jesus who came to live among us and show us what perfection is. I doubt if most of us would claim uh, perfection. We might say that we do a lot of good things in our lives, but then if we're honest, we will also admit that we live pretty selfish lives. And when God was communicating his standards uh, to the people of Israel, to Moses in the Old Testament, uh, he gave the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments are kind of a summary of the morality of God. And so if we measure our lives against the Ten Commandments, have we ever taken the Lord's name in vain? Uh, Have we ever uh, worshipped other gods, made things in our lives idols besides God? Uh, Have we ever uh, lied? Have we ever told a lie? Have we ever coveted after things that are not our possessions? If we've done any of these things, it shows the flaws, the imperfections of our lives. So even though in some sense we can say that we're good, maybe good compared to Hitler, <laughs> but are we perfect by God's perfect standards? I doubt if most people would make that claim about their lives. Well, the God I know, why would he ever send anybody to hell? If he's got grace for me and loves me, God wouldn't send me to hell. Yeah. Well, there's a famous uh, teacher in the church from a generation, a couple generations ago named C.S. Lewis. And Lewis used to say that it isn't God so much that sends us to hell. It's we ourselves who make the choice to separate ourselves from God. And God has created this place for us to go where he'll never bother us again. Hell is not a pleasant place because none of the good gifts of God are there. Uh, Community is not there. And love and family and all the goodness of God is missing in hell because we are completely on our own there. Now, hell may be more than that. If you read in the New Testament places, descriptions of hell, it may be a bit more severe than that. But for our purposes here, hell is minimally separation from God. And so it's not so much that God points a finger at you and say, oh, you're not good enough. You're going to hell. God has given you an invitation to be part of his family. You and I maybe have said no to that invitation. And he's going, well, okay, if you don't want to live in the household of God, you're going to be living in the streets. And the streets in this case is spelled H-E-L-L. It's a place where I am not. Okay, Rick Matson, you've just got my attention, and I want to take that step of faith. How would I get there? Yeah. Well, God did something about our condition. God said, I realize that you're separated from me. I am unsatisfied with this arrangement. I'm coming down to talk with you. It's like the parent who's sitting in the front seat and say, I'm going to come back <laughs> and talk with my kids in the back seat. I'm coming back there. But in this case, it's an invitation back into family. It's always about the family of God. So God came to us in Jesus Christ. He lived a perfect life. He taught what it means to live these standards, but he also knew that none of us can live up to them. And he said, if you place your faith in me, in the work that I'm going to do to pay for your imperfections, pay for your sins, if you embrace me in faith, then you can be reconciled to God, and I will prove it. Mm-hmm. I won't just stay dead. I will rise from the dead, and uh, I will overcome death, and I will overcome sin. And if you unite yourself to me in faith, you too will be reconciled to God, and you will live in a place where God does dwell, not dwell hell where he isn't, mm-hmm. but heaven where he is, and that will be a magnificent and glorious eternity. You can repent right now of your sin. Yes. And Place your faith in Jesus Christ, and I hope you do it. Um, Thank you for uh, being on the show today, Rick. It's been very uh, enlightening, and I always like having you on. Nice teamwork. Thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah. It's quite a team. 
That wraps up our show for the day and for the week. Thank you for supporting Faith Radio. See you next week. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.